Hello, uh, my name is Daniel Mercer. I'm one of the first year medical students here at Warwick. Uh, before I came here, I did a, an anatomy and biology degree at uh, the University of Liverpool. And then I was a practitioner in ophthalmology for two years at the Eye Hospital in Manchester and spent the previous year before coming here dispatching ambulances back in Liverpool. So why make the decision to come to medical school? It was a long thought thing that I had put off for some time. Um, I always, always wanted to be a history teacher, always. And then English literature was something I loved. And then I did biology A-level as well. So I did those three A-levels. And I sort of thought, what's the common denominator here? It's people. It's the story of people. So I thought, okay, what, what can I do that's people-like? So I thought, I'll do a modern history degree. So I started doing that. And within a week, I dropped out for, that's a long story. <laughs> yeah, so I, um, I, I, I dropped out of my history degree after a week because uh, I was in a um, seminar. We were talking about the Cold War and we were talking about um, JFK, the president's assassination, and we were reading his autopsy report. And I thought, I don't understand any of these words at all. What is a calvarium? What is, you know, the occipital thing? But I thought, this is really interesting. This is way more interesting than anything else I've ever studied before. And I took the decision that day to go to the admissions office, drop out of my history degree, and then I Googled some of those words, and anatomy came up. And so I decided to do a degree in anatomy, which had me in the morgue and the medical school for three to four years, teaching medical students sometimes. Um, and that's when it started to go in my head and say, maybe this is something you could do. You didn't immediately become a doctor, though. You, you left your degree yeah. in anatomy mm -hmm. and then you did your other jobs. Mm -hmm. Why not just go straight to medical school? Because actually, I'm not entirely convinced, and this is okay, that I want to be a practicing doctor full time. I, I do love medicine and medical science, and I love talking to people, um, and I love the sort of the art of medicine and taking a history, of the full history of a patient beyond sort of the medicine into those social histories and things. Um, but I also love teaching. And so I thought that with my knowledge of anatomy and physiology, I'm best placed to teach in a medical school. I'd like to have the broader understanding, but that took a while because I thought maybe I could get away with just having the anatomy knowledge, which you of course can do. And there's plenty of fantastic anatomists who are pure anatomists. But for me, I wasn't sort of sated with that. I sort of wanted the clinical correlates alongside that as well. So what were you doing at the eye hospital? Okay, so my job at the eye hospital started, I started off as a medical photographer and that branched out to um, ophthalmic practitioner, which meant that I did a whole suite of scans and examinations on people's eyes using slit lamps, ophthalmoscopes and all the different visual field testings, not the wiggly finger, but uh, the actual visual field machines and things. Um, and worked in diabetic clinics as well with patients doing diabetic assessments and taking things like that and a lot of teaching. So I helped design a sort of basic science curriculum in ophthalmology for the non-clinical staff um, because there's very little ophthalmology taught in nursing school or any other kind of thing like that or the technicians and they really wanted to know about glaucoma and how the eye works and things so that's, that's what I did. Cool and then the ambulance dispatching? Yeah, that was a complete change of pace. So as much as I loved outpatient uh, diabetic clinics, I thought I need a bit of adrenaline in my life. So I applied on a whim for the ambulance service and got a job as a dispatcher and then became an advanced dispatcher, um, answering the 999 calls as well and triaging and giving life-saving advice over the phone and things. Having been out of university education for some time, did you feel kind of dropped in at the deep end when it came to learning medicine week? Um, well, in, in terms of the actual content, no. But in terms of getting back to, um, okay, I can have a bit of a lion because I started work at six o'clock in the ambulance service. <laughs> um, so that was, that was kind of weird. It's, it's the, the student pace and the student life is very different. So actually going back to do another freshers week was very surreal for me. Um, as I imagine it would be for some people who were in the mid to late 20s. Going back to what you did when you were 18 is odd. And pictures were appearing on my Facebook feed of friends of mine who were getting mortgages were like, interesting. <laughs>
I feel like the workload, at, at least here at Warwick, is quite high in the first year. Did you adjust to it okay? Yeah, I think I did adjust to it um, okay. I know a lot of people didn't. Uh, I spent quite a bit of time doing a bit of tutoring and teaching people and helping, and that was really good to help consolidate my knowledge as well. But you have to be very strict and regimented and keep on it. So you have, they have these formative exams at the end of each block. So the first year is divided into five blocks. And there's an online exam that you can take. And you can choose to take an open book or closed book. Um, so with your notes or without your notes. And I, always, I made a rule from the very beginning, take them all without your notes. So you can sort of identify how far you have to go, what you still need to learn. So sort of using it as like a sort of barometer, a measure of where I am. And that really helped me keep pace with the course, I think. So it's, it's, about, it's about having that ability to sort of see far ahead. Were you at home on the Anatomy Fridays? Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> I, I, yeah I, I enjoyed the Anatomy Fridays. <laughs> if you've already been through an anatomy degree, mm -hmm. how do you feel about the way anatomy is taught to medical students and um, moreover, the way anatomy is taught here at Warwick? Okay, so I would say the way that anatomy is taught in medical school is very different to the way that you do it in a conventional anatomy degree very different. It is quicker, it's more superficial. Um, one of my friends who's also an anatomist came up with quite a good analogy for this, so I can't claim to have this, which was um, if you imagine the anatomy that you're taught in an anatomy degree is when you're taught how to design a car, whereas if you are um, a medical student learning anatomy, it's how to drive the car. So it's, 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 it's quite different in that regard. Um, there's a, it's a lot more applied. But um, yeah, it's still very interesting. There's an increasing move, I think, from medical schools in the UK to, to get away from dissection mm -hmm. and even prosection in some cases. Um, and here at Warwick, we use only plastinates. How do you feel about that, having that deeper anatomy knowledge that you do? Yeah, I did, I did dissection for a number of years um, and it is very, it's very interesting. It's quite humbling to know they've donated their body to you. Um, in terms of actual teachable elements, I think if you are going to be a foot surgeon, you need to spend time dissecting the foot. I think you need to spend time doing that. But if you're doing general anatomy, I think it's much more important to build up pictures with already dissected prosections um, and to use the surface anatomy and the imaging that they focus on a lot here. Um, and then the specific clinical correlates of that anatomy. So I would like there to be the option of dissection, but it is very time consuming. There's a lot of aesthetic clearing, a lot of treating and preserving going on. It's a lot more expensive and it's quite a skill. It's quite an artistic skill. So you, you can spend dozens and dozens of hours preparing a finger dissection, which you just don't have time for on these accelerated courses for 200 people to do that in order to understand the finger. So I totally understand the change. Okay. How have you felt being on the wards? Uh, I've enjoyed the wards. I spent some time on the wards um, at the eye hospital in Manchester um, for patients who obviously couldn't get like post-operative patients and pre-operative patients for certain procedures. So I enjoyed the wards, felt quite at home there, um, and really enjoyed talking to people. So there are, there are some 200 plus PowerPoints you've got to learn in first year at medical school. And so getting out of that lecture hall and seeing some application of that is, it's a wonderful thing. It's so good to be out there. You discussed your kind of fondness for literature and the kind of, um, the storytelling mm. aspect that can come out of medicine. Who are your favorite medical authors? Uh, okay, so I have, I have two authors of sort of like the medical neuroscience that are sort of like my go-to. Um, Oliver Sacks, bless him. He was a visiting professor here. He died a few years ago. Um, and Robert Sapolsky, who's a primatologist in uh, LA, I think, or California. Yeah, California. Can you recommend me a title by each? Actually, so I said so that there are many books that Oliver Sacks did where he wrote in fantastic prose about a patient. So whereas you might have, you know, patient has had a stroke in the notes or the type of stroke, and then the scan linked to it. Oliver Sacks would write a 300-page book about how that stroke affected the patient. 
um, which can be quite a lot to handle, but it's so interesting. And boy, does it help you remember what the consequences are of that stroke. Um, so it's, it's, it's a fantastic resource. And he was very much of the proponent that the, um, the story of the patient is dying in medicine. And we're being overtaken by technology and by numbers and statistics and things, which are obviously vitally important, but there's still a human element. It's not just a science, it's an art as well. In terms of Robert Sapolsky, his book, Behave, is absolutely fantastic. It's a big book, <laughs> but it's wonderful. It sort of, it takes the, um, it takes the biology of behavior. So it's like if a psychology course was written by a biologist, basically. As of the end of first year, you've got another set of exams in a year and then finals um, mm. a little while after that. Have you got any long-term career plans? Um, so I've got a few. Um, I really am very passionate about palliative care, very passionate about it. Um, and this actually stems from my other love, which is neurology, obviously, which you might have gathered at this point. Um, because whenever I mention neurology to people, what I either hear is, oh, that sounds a bit difficult, or that sounds a bit cerebral and not very hands-on. Or I hear, oh, well, you don't really cure any patients, do you? So where's, where's the glory in that kind of thing? And for me, it's sort of like, well, you know, if a patient has multiple sclerosis or has had a horrendous stroke, they still need looking after? They still need help and support. And why is that less of a worthy endeavor? And so I think that too often we can be wrapped up in the quick fix. I know a lot of people who want to be surgeons because that bone's broken, so I'll go and fix that bone and there's a result. The complex gray area, which is the black box of the human brain, so the neurologist, the psychiatrist, the neurosurgeon deals with on a day-to-day -day basis, that is a bit more mushy and it can put a lot of people off. But to me, I like that. Cool. Yeah. Um, like you. <laughs> well, quite, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so is there anything about medical school that you found that isn't quite what you expected it would be in any regard? So I have to say, and this is not an unpopular opinion, um, but I speak for myself, that um, the, so we have a set of modules called SOP Pop VLE. Um, which is social population, value, laws and ethics, which of course are very important for doctors. And I really do not like the way it's taught at all, which is lists of bullet points for ethical discussions of very controversial points. I feel like it's taught how science is taught. They're trying to teach a humanities as they teach a science. And what it should require, in my opinion, what it should be, is debate and long form essays that are assessed and then you take sock pop VLE out of the exam and you make it a coursework based thing where you can have seminars and vivas and talk about it and debate the points and I think people would resent that a lot less and it would change the pressures of final exam. It wouldn't necessarily lessen them because you're going to have to learn more anatomy and physiology but it would change it and I think that if that if they were more open to a broader examination format as opposed to just examining through multiple choice questions or short answer questions. I think that people could gain a lot more from those um, ethical elements and things. You've obviously worked a few different jobs within the NHS. So you've, you've worked in the, the diabetic clinics and dispatching ambulances and things. How do you feel about the kind of stability of the NHS, the environment it exists in at the moment? I think it's in a lot of trouble. I think, I think that the problem, quite simply, has been that as the population grows and ages, which is a fantastic thing, we want more people and we want them to live longer, we haven't kept step with the funding for healthcare. We simply haven't. And it goes to a broader societal level of health in general. So if you have a low minimum wage and underemployment, then people are more likely to be getting sick, they're more likely to be getting mental health problems, they're more likely to be stressed and less enjoying of life. And these things are terrible for the human body. And I think that what the NHS is really good at is very cutting edge world leading specialist care in particular things, such as oncology and neurosurgery and all that jazz, and emergency medicine. If you are really sick, you can get to one of the best 
stroke positions in the world pretty quickly, almost anywhere in Britain. But that's not what we need to be focusing on. It's the upstream factors of why have they had a stroke in the first place. So our culture is built more for when you've had the car crash versus wearing the seatbelt, which is cheaper and much more effective. And that's seen most clearly in mental health provision. So the way that this culture is structured, the way that things are omitted, and the way that things are emphasized means that we are doing a terrible job at keeping this country in sound mental health. And when we get to extremis, there's something there, but you have to be an absolute extremis. I can't tell you the number of people in the ambulance service who called me suicidal or whose families called them, whose families called 999 because there's been a successful or almost a successful suicide attempt. And we have had 20, 30 missed calls from them for months begging for help that didn't exist. And you better believe that when they attempt to hang themselves, a doctor goes to their house, three ambulances go and three police cars go. And then they're sent off to recess and we spend thousands of pounds, the equivalent of two years therapy. So we can spend the money when they're trying to kill themselves, but we can't spend the money months earlier when it wouldn't have had such a profound effect. The model is oriented wrong. Yep, yeah, um, so I'm on the Ophthalmology Society committee where we've done a few education events and met to talk about all things eyes, um, which ties in with my previous job. But one fantastic thing that I've been involved with um, is the Palliative Care Society. They hosted a day called the Death Cafe, um, which was um, a very really nice discussion. People brought in loads of cakes and things and we sat on bean bags nice calming music and we talked about death for three hours which sounds very peculiar but it's sort of to try to break the taboo and the stigma and it's talking about how palliative care should really be beginning years before death and so many people refuse palliation palliative care to help ease their passing because they're afraid of death or the stigma of going into a hospice means the world's given up on me and i'm going to die and i'm going to be alone and so i think that it was, it sounds, it sounds quite macabre and a bit depressing, but actually it's such a positive thing. And we were talking about some really dark matters in a very positive and upbeat way because it's, it's something that's so important in medicine. It's so rarely spoken about and end of life discussions are very important and a good death is very possible. Have you had any time to kind of work on your own projects? It sounds from what you were saying before, like you sort of like to be kept busy. Um, have you found time for your own things? Yeah, I do like to be kept busy for sure. Um, so I've been doing a lot of teaching and tutoring, as I said, and I swim like crazy. But the big thing that I'm doing with quite a few people now, and it's, the team seems to be growing every week, is a project called MedGuide. Um, and we have a number of different resources that we're doing, which includes a podcast. Um, and a big bank of multiple choice questions, which are 15 to 20 questions for every lecture in the first year and that's growing. We're about halfway through that now. Uh, we've got a really nice website that's coming up. That's aimed mainly at Warwick students, but we're going to be expanding it out for physician associate programs and the other Warwick curricula as time goes on. And we're, we've also made a pre-med package, which we finished filming yesterday and is in the editing process right now, which is a series of 10 short videos where we're going to be talking about the different systems of the body so you have something to pin on to it's a nice learning underpinning uh, for starting medicine or for thinking, well, what is medical school? Uh, so thanks very much for watching. Uh, my email will be on screen if you've got any questions. Uh, so, yeah, thank you.